Good morning. My name is Benjamin Greenberg, and I'm an associate professor of neurology at the University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. I'm here today to talk about a unique B cell derived signature of multiple sclerosis and its biologic implications. I look forward to an interactive session. As you know, you can send questions through the internet, and I'll be answering them at the end. With that in mind, let me first uh, note some disclosures to my talk today. I've received consulting fees from a number, number of companies, but the one important here is Diagenics Incorporated, with which I do own equity. They have an exclusive license from the University of Texas Southwestern for some of the technology that will be talked about today. The goals of today's talk are to introduce you to a disease known as multiple sclerosis. For some in the audience, this may be something you're well familiar with. For others, this may be a new clinical entity. I'll also discuss the data we have both within the University of Texas Southwestern and what's been published relative to the role of B cells in the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis. We'll go on to talk about the data that's been generated here at UT Southwestern known as the antibody gene signature of multiple sclerosis and go on to more recent work that's shown the biologic implications of this signal seen in the spinal fluid of patients with MS. And finally, we'll talk about future directions, we are, where we plan to go with this research and what you can expect to see out of labs and collaborators here in Dallas. So let's start with an introduction of multiple sclerosis. Some of you in the audience may not be aware of how this disease presents, and I thought it would be useful to give you a typical background of what our patients may experience. So in this situation, a 28-year-old woman comes to her physician indicating that for a week she's had pain in her eye and some blurred vision. When the physician tests her, uh, they find that she does have reduced visual acuity. She used to be 20-20, and maybe now she's 20-40 or 20-60 in that eye. And she indicates every time she moves her eye, it hurts and has a, a dull ache around the eye. When her physician performs an exam, the rest of it is normal. They don't find any other abnormalities. But upon questioning, she indicates that a year earlier, she had gone to her doctor indicating that she was numb from the waist down. The doctor just kind of dismissed it and said she had a uh, pinched nerve and sent her along her way. Over On its own, over about eight weeks, it resolved and no other treatment was, was needed. But now she was coming in with the vision issues. So an MRI uh, was ordered by her physician and it revealed multiple abnormalities within her brain that were consistent with something called demyelination. And it was based on this and her history of multiple events over time that she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and started one of the 10 FDA approved therapies for this chronic condition. This is a pretty typical presentation of how MS gets diagnosed. A lot of times, however, people can have atypical presentations or more unusual presentations, and there's a large differential diagnosis. There are a lot of things as a neurologist I think about when a patient like this comes to my office. So multiple sclerosis, just to give you some background, is the most common cause of disability in young adults, especially in the United States. It affects anywhere from three to 600,000 individuals in the US and probably about one and a half to two million patients worldwide. It's more prevalent in women than in men. It's about a two to one or even, excuse me, three to one ratio in women to men. And it's more common among those of Northern European descent. Usually this gets diagnosed in people's 20s and 30s. It, it hits individuals in their prime. And often, in about, uh, I should say, 10% of cases, we can see the first symptom happen in the pediatric years. And so this is not a disease exclusively of adults, but definitely the majority of folks are diagnosed, again, in their 20s and 30s. And it has a massive cost in the United States. The figures noted here around $10 billion a year are probably on the conservative side. Over the last several years, the cost of drug therapy, uh, especially in the United States, has skyrocketed, with the average annual cost being somewhere between fifty and sixty thousand dollars per patient per year for one of the FDA approved therapies. It's making multiple sclerosis one of the most expensive conditions in the US. At the same time that the expense has gone up with these drugs, we have found uh, tremendous efficacy but there are risks. And so we are left in a situation where accurate diagnosis becomes incredibly important so that we are only treating people who actually need the therapy. So here are some of the different symptoms somebody with multiple sclerosis might experience. As in the case that I presented, this person had vision loss. Uh, some people can have double vision where all of a sudden they say they're seeing two of things. Imbalance, it can look like they've had a few too many drinks when walking down the street. They can have weakness, 
they can have numbness, they can have difficulty walking, pain, bladder dysfunction, depression, cognitive dysfunction, fatigue, sexual dysfunction. And for each of our patients, they have a different combination of these various symptoms. For some individuals, they start with vision loss and progress to include the other symptoms. But for others, they may start with just the fatigue and then develop numbness later. The reason keeping track of that is important is because it increases the sense of, a, of awareness that the differential diagnosis can be quite difficult. There are a lot of diseases within neurology that can present with numbness. There are a lot of diseases within neurology that can present with imbalance or gait difficulties. So when you're that first physician and you're seeing a patient with one of these symptoms, you don't know off the bat that they have multiple sclerosis. They could have a whole host of other conditions. And so trying to sort out what the cause of your patient's symptoms are, it can be quite tricky. This is not a new problem. We've had this since the beginning. In fact, the first clinical description of multiple sclerosis probably goes back to the 1400s. There's writings of a Dutch patron saint of ice skating, Ludvina of Scheiden. Uh, how you get to be the patron saint of ice skating, I don't know, but evidently this teenage girl experienced a series of neurologic events that when we look back in history sounded like a pretty classic description of multiple sclerosis. Now back in her day there were discussions of demonic possession and all sorts of things, but in the end, uh, looking back in hindsight, we feel she had a pretty classic case of MS. Unfortunately, uh, even though we've had over 600 years pass since uh, the Dutch patron saint of ice skating uh, suffered these symptoms, often we're still in the dark relative to the explanation and the diagnosis. If you fast forward to the 1800s, Jean-Martin Charcot did the first clinical pathologic description of multiple sclerosis. So what he did in France was analyze patients clinically, see what their symptoms were over time, and do very careful, careful histories and physicals uh, documenting what was happening to patients. And throughout his career, he followed these patients to see what the long-standing implications were, what disabilities did they develop, what types of problems they had. But he went further to look at these patients in a post-mortem fashion to describe what was happening at the pathologic level, first in uh, gross terms and also in microscopic terms. And what Jean-Martin Charcot did was correlate what he was seeing within the pathologic specimens with what he had seen within the clinic. So that first clinical pathologic correlation. And indeed, what Jean-Martin Charcot saw was changes within the brain as seen here, a slice of brain with arrows pointing out the so-called plaques of multiple sclerosis, the sclerotic plaques. Now, you'll note where all of those arrows are, they're in a typical distribution of multiple sclerosis. They're around the ventricles, those deep-seated holes in the middle of the brain where we make spinal fluid. Some of them abut the gray matter, the so-called juxtacortical lesions. And these abnormalities, which can be seen grossly at autopsy, correlate sometimes with the symptoms that patients have, but not always. There are some parts of the brain where if you derive one of these plaques for multiple sclerosis, you will have very reproducible symptoms. If it's along the cortical spinal tract, you'll have weakness. If it's along the somatosensory tract, you may have uh, difficulty with sensation. But a lot of these plaques are not in what are known as clinically eloquent areas, meaning the symptoms you may have may be non-existent or extremely vague. Thus, patients can have a large number of changes in their brain with no symptoms whatsoever. This is not a unique feature of multiple sclerosis, but due to the pathology in MS, we see it quite frequently. Thus, when somebody comes to me for a diagnosis, often that first symptom they have is not actually the first attack that they've had. It's just been the first attack that happened in a clinically eloquent area. Sometimes, however, patients come with their first attack being in a clinically eloquent area, and we don't have the evidence of previous attacks, again, making diagnosis a little difficult. Now, back in 1868, Jean-Martin Charcot, with limited resources and technologies, especially compared to today, did a, an, an incredible job with the clinical pathologic description of this disease. And if you go back to his original writings about the pathology, what he saw under the microscope in multiple sclerosis, it was quite extraordinary. As noted here, he said, on histologic sections, multiple sclerosis lesions contain perivascular inflammation and demyelination. Plaques occur anywhere within the white matter of the central nervous system, and he noted the most frequently affected areas, including the optic nerves, brainstem, cerebellum, and spinal cord. The lesions in these locations often correlate to symptoms, and in the cerebral hemispheres, there is a periventricular distribution of these plaques. 
When there's plaques, however, about the cortex, the so-called juxtacortical lesions, you can even see subcortical myelinated nerves being spared, but plaques located near the gray, white, uh, the gray matter may extend into the gray matter. So these descriptions of multiple sclerosis, which again happened 150 years ago, are incredibly similar to our descriptions of what we see pathologically today. Even with all of our technologies, whether it be imaging, MRI, or in a histopathology lab looking at gross sections of tissue, we have not done a dramatically better job of the pathologic description of MS. We've noted that this is an inflammatory disorder, a demyelinating disorder, but even in the 1860s, Charcot noted that it is not just a disorder of white matter. The gray matter is involved, and the axons, which are what connect the cell bodies to the rest of the nervous system, can be transected in multiple sclerosis. These key features of MS have been the underpinning of our uh, advancement of technology, our advancement of imaging, our advancement of therapies for 150 years, and there have not been a number of breakthroughs in the pathologic setting until the last 10 years. So if you go back over time and try and sort out what causes MS, what's the biologic underpinning, it's been an interesting history. So if you go back to the 1900s and ask what was the cause of multiple sclerosis, you'd be told there, you weren't sweating enough. So we'd send our patients home, we'd say, get into bed, pull the covers up over your head and sweat more. It turns out that that's not true and it doesn't work. If you move to the 19-teens, multiple sclerosis was considered to be a disorder of toxic exposures. And we were told, telling our patients to purge their system. By the 1940s, we talked about multiple sclerosis being a disease of poor circulation. And if we could just augment circulation, things would be better, so we prescribed vasodilators. That didn't work. It's not until the 1960s with the, immune, the world of immunology really maturing that we first started to talk about multiple sclerosis in the setting of an immune system. And we defined it as a uh, allergic reaction. And if you took enough vitamins and antihistamines, maybe it would help. And then as we move to 2000, you get the first description of multiple sclerosis, I should say the 1980s all the way through 2000, 1970s through 2000, of multiple sclerosis being an autoimmune condition with a immune system presumably reacting against myelin. And if we can modulate that immune system or sometimes even suppress that immune system, we can prevent uh, the symptoms and, and uh, the disability that comes with multiple sclerosis. And this theory, an autoimmune reaction against myelin, has driven the field for the last 30 to 40 years. And there are a couple key features embedded in this theory that are worth noting. The first is that this is an autoimmune disease, and we're going to move into the actors within immunology in a moment. But the second is the target of the autoimmune disease is incredibly important relative to explaining what we see clinically and what are the therapeutic options. If indeed this is a disease purely of antigens within myelin driving the clinical response, then it would take us down one path relative to developing prognostics, diagnostics, and therapeutics. If, however, the autoimmune attack is directed against a variety of antigens, it may dramatically change the way we think about multiple sclerosis. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today with our data from B-cell repertoires of MS patients. So what happens clinically in multiple sclerosis? So you have this autoimmune disease. Jean-Martin Charcot saw perivascular inflammation, lymphocytes around the blood vessels within the brain. You have demyelination, and you can have damage to the axons. Clinically, what I see in my multiple sclerosis center here in Dallas, Texas, is one of four patterns of disease, with the most common being represented at the top of this graphic, known as relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. And in relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, the theory is the immune system goes in, causes inflammation and demyelination in a clinically eloquent area, and you get one of those orange bars, which is a clinical symptom. If you think back to our 28-year-old, her first bar was the numbness from the waist down, which got completely dismissed by her physician as being a pinched nerve. Her second bar on this graph would have been her optic neuritis, that visual change that she had, that blurring of vision that she experienced over a year later. Untreated, relapsed remitting multiple sclerosis patients go on to have future attacks represented here by each bar. But as you'll notice over time, that bar doesn't go back down to baseline. We don't always recover from the attacks we have in multiple sclerosis, and you can start to develop disability over time with each successive attack, less recovery, and hence if it, there's an attack that affects your walking, you may not get back to normal walking. Sometimes you do, but often you don't. There are other versions of multiple sclerosis, however, which seem to be linked, at least pathologically. There's a so-called secondary progressive phase of MS, which is designated by the second orange uh, construct on this graph, 
where patients start off as relapse remitting disease with attacks that come in and recovery that comes after the attack. But after a period of years, it might be a few years or even 15 or 20 years, the patient changes into what's called a secondary progressive state, where the attacks cease to occur, at least clinically, but every year is a little worse than the year before, so-called progression where I may see a patient this month and they're using a cane, but they come back a year later and they're using a walker and there's been no intervening attacks. This is the so-called secondary progressive stage of MS. And when untreated, up to half of our patients will go on to have secondary progressive disease. The rarest versions of the disease are the primary progressive and progressive relapsing versions of the disease. In primary progressive, there are no relapses that we ever see, but from the beginning, every year is worse than the year before with a slow progression of symptoms. The most common form of multiple sclerosis is relapsing remitting, and if we're talking about untreated disease, a lot, if not the majority, of relapsing remitting patients go on to have a secondary progressive course. So the majority of cases of MS and the majority of research in MS has focused on so-called relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. Now here's another way of looking at relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. Seen here in green is the level of disability. And so there's an individual, and this is clinical, this is the person coming into my clinic. So that first green bar for that 28-year-old woman we discussed would be the numbness from the waist down. And she recovered completely. She went back down to her baseline. And then time goes on, and a second event, her optic neuritis occurs. And if we do nothing, over years, she may have more and more clinical events, and then ultimately go on, perhaps, to secondary progressive disease. But what's happening beneath the surface? We, we can see that in the clinic. I can see that by talking to my patients and examining my patients. But what's underlying this? And there is a lot of biology underlying these events. I'll draw your attention now to the orange bars on this graph. Notice that there are many more orange bars, events of inflammation, cells going into the brain causing damage, then there are clinical events. And indeed, by the time our 28-year-old woman had had her first event of numbness from the waist down, she had had multiple inflammatory events, but they just never occurred in an area that gave her symptoms, or they never reached a threshold that would ca cause profound symptoms. So she was unaware of these inflammatory events. Now, with each of these inflammatory events, there's damage done. There's demyelination and potential axonal loss, but it's only when it crosses a certain threshold that we're clinically aware of it. The other way to think about this is our clinical measures of this disease are insensitive for tracking the disease and are insensitive for diagnosing the disease. There are lots of things that can give people symptoms, and there are also lots of ways to have damage with no symptoms. And so getting a better handle on what's happening under the surface, beyond what we see in the clinic, is incredibly important. The other thing you'll note here in the shaded blue is the axonal loss that grows over time. It is this loss of axons that we think drives progression. So you can have demyelinating events over and over and over again and have symptoms that come and go, and they will leave damage, and perhaps you may not recover fully. But if I look at the 20, 30, or 40-year uh, span of multiple sclerosis that patients uh, are used to dealing with, their long-term disability is probably dictated by the number of axons that cut more than the amount of myelin content that gets damaged. Thus, the secondary progressive phase and probably the primary progressive phase of multiple sclerosis is dictated by that axonal loss more so than damage to myelin. That's a theory, but there's a lot of data to support it. Why is that important? Well, again, it goes back to the underlying theory of multiple sclerosis being an autoimmune disease that targets myelin. We do have evidence to say that's true, but if there is an autoimmune, if there is a component to the autoimmune profile that targets the axons, the neurons, the glial cells, leading to a, an accentuated axonal loss, this would be incredibly important for us to understand to get a handle on the difference between the relapses that patients have and the progression and axonal loss that patients have. So as you keep this in mind, it will play a role in what we find within the B-cell repertoire of multiple sclerosis. Now, what is that perivascular inflammation? So the relapses that we see are probably dictated by these little blue cells, uh, lymphocytes. We don't see neutrophils, we don't see eosinophils, we don't see basophils in the brains of multiple sclerosis patients, hardly ever, if at all. But we do see this perivascular inflammation, these little blue cells, lymphocytes, T and B cells, around blood vessels that then will spread out in a concentric ring around that blood vessel, causing demyelination and that plaque, that scar, that Jean-Martin Charcot saw 150 years ago.
Luckily, these days, we have a less invasive way than biopsy or autopsy for tracking the inflammation within multiple sclerosis. And as seen on the screen, you see a typical T1-weighted post-gadolinium MRI. What that sentence means is we're getting a certain uh, picture of the brain, we're injecting contrast, in this case gadolinium, and anywhere that there's been a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, perhaps by perivascular inflammation, you see that white circle, that so-called enhancement, the accumulation of contrast, highlighting that there's active inflammation in that part of the brain. And this correlates with uh, active disease. We have done multiple studies comparing tissue to what we saw in MRI and what patients experience. And when you look in these tissues, almost always, you will see active inflammation. Within MRIs, however, you can also find a variety of other findings. It's not just good for seeing active disease, but you can see the burden of disease that's occurred over time. So one example in the top left of here is the so-called T2 hyperintense lesions. And you can see a couple white spots within the brain that show you where old scars have occurred. And it can happen in the cerebral hemispheres, it can happen in the brain stem, the spinal cord. But in the lower left corner of this slide, you'll see that this patient has a more significant burden of disease, a lot of periventricular lesions, and they are starting to have atrophy of the brain, something that we see accelerated within multiple sclerosis because of those lost axons we see that the brain shrinks over time. Unfortunately for all of us, we have brain shrinkage as we get over, older, but in multiple sclerosis, this is accelerated, and it's something that leads, or at least I should say correlates, with the level of disability that patients have over time. So what's happening within the perivascular inflammation? You can't give a talk with that in multiple sclerosis without having a very busy slide such as this, showing all the different actors within the central nervous system, including oligodendrocytes, neurons, astrocytes, microglial cells, myelinated axons, and also showing evidence that there is an interplay between the immune system, both the innate and adaptive immune system, uh, uh, within the brain and the adaptive immune system circulating throughout the body. Hence, the lymphocytes have to transgress across a blood vessel, they have to diapodese across that blood vessel, and lead to inflammation within the brain parenchyma, or spinal cord parenchyma, to lead to demyelination. Both T and B cells have data to suggest they're involved, but it's worth noting that for 20, 30 years, this was wholly thought of as a T cell disease, as a CD4 and perhaps CD8 mediated disease. And it was a great way to start fistfights at meetings 20 years ago, talking about which was more important, the CD4 T cell or the CD8 T cell for propagating the disease. But what about the B cells in multiple sclerosis? So there's a lot of data to suggest that we should consider multiple sclerosis as a B cell disease. And it's worth noting that this would be heresy uh, 20 years ago. It was thought of as B, B cells being peripherally involved in multiple sclerosis, but not a central actor within the disease. But what's the data to suggest that this may not be the case? Well, if you look at patients who have not developed clinical MS yet, if you look in that pre-onset area, there's a couple pieces of data. There's the data about Epstein-Barr infection and vitamin D deficiency being risk factors for developing multiple sclerosis. And both of these things, Epstein-Barr infection and vitamin D deficiency, have profound impacts on B-cell biology. Pretty circumstantial evidence and not enough to, to convince uh, a, a jury, so to say. But there's evidence throughout the course of the disease. For example, when you look at somebody's first clinical event, a so-called clinically isolated syndrome, you can find that peripheral B cells uh, with that 28-year-old who had the numbness from the waist down had higher levels of expression of certain subunits uh, that are responsible for getting in uh, across the blood-brain barrier, the so-called VLA4 receptor. You can look at the spinal fluid uh, patients at their first event and see that they have more B cells than you would expect. And you can see that if you look at those B cells for markers of activation, there are a variety of markers that show that they're active. They're not there passively responding just to, to local inflammation, but they may be playing an active role. As you move into clinically definite multiple sclerosis, so-called relapsing remitting stage, there's a variety of data sets that suggest B cells play a critical role. We're going to talk about oligoclonal bands, what they are, and, and how they're related to multiple sclerosis. And you're going to see that the overwhelming majority of patients with multiple sclerosis are Epstein-Barr virus positive. And there's a variety of changes in CSF profiles that suggest B cells play uh, an incredible role in the pathogenesis of MS. And we're going to review data from MS patients on if you deplete those B cells, does it make a difference to the course of the disease? Finally, within the progressive stages of the disease, there's pathologic data to suggest that B cells are playing a driving role. So let's take a few of these uh, pieces of circumstantial evidence and see what the data is to convince you that B cells are a critical portion of multiple sclerosis. 
So oligoclonal bands. So uh, oligoclonal bands is a test that's been around for over 50 years. It was put into use in the 1960s and basically is a measure of intrathecal synthesis of antibodies. What does that mean? So we take a person's serum and we take a person's CSF, and what we're supposed to do is isolate out IgG molecules and then subject those molecules to isoelectric focusing to get these distinct, uh, presumably clonal bands of antibody production. And indeed, uh, what has been seen in a large number of MS patients is there is a pattern of bands in the spinal fluid that we don't see in the serum. So for years, this was considered one of the gold standard tests of the biology of MS, that we could see a pattern of inflammation within MS patients that we didn't see in others. The problem is the sensitivity and specificity is not where we want it to be. It turns out, due to this being a qualitative test, not a quantitative test, that the sensitivity is extremely lacking when in a real world scenario. And the specificity is also not where we want it to be. A lot of different conditions that can affect the central nervous system can give you oligoclonal bands. So it's not a specific test of multiple sclerosis, it's a specific test of seeing intrathecal synthesis of antibodies, and unfortunately there are a lot of different conditions that can do that. But this has to date been our only biologic test of autoimmunity relative to multiple sclerosis. If we look at progressive patients, one of the most exciting features uh, that we've seen in the last 10 years is the revelation that you can develop follicular structures, kind of small lymph nodes within the brain and the meninges of multiple sclerosis patients. And indeed, you see B cells playing a critical role in the formation of these follicles. So pathologically, what we're seeing is over time, MS patients set up an autoimmune profile histologically that implicates B cell biology as playing an integral role to the pathogenesis of this disease. These follicles also may explain why some people go on to secondary progressive disease and have ongoing inflammation despite therapies directed at their peripheral immune system that seem to do a good job. If there is a compartmentalized autoimmune system within the CNS, we may not necessarily be able to reach that with therapeutics peripherally. Finally, let's ask the question, if B cells are so important to this disease, what happens if I wipe out your B cells? And indeed, there have been a number of trials looking at the drug rituximab, uh, which is not FDA approved for multiple sclerosis. Uh, these were uh, approved trials that were blinded and placebo controlled. And indeed, after infusion with rituximab, which is an anti-CD20 molecule, leading to B cell depletion within patients, in, those patients did dramatically better. And as seen here on the graph, what happened was these patients, about 100 of them, were followed over time with serial MRIs to look for the appearance of new lesions. And in patients who had not been treated, they went on to have new lesions over time, as you would expect in multiple sclerosis. But for those who were treated with rituximab, the disease activity was basically suppressed. And so if you take out the B cells, it looks like you can change the course of the disease. So we have uh, biologic, although not sensitive or specific data from spinal fluid looking at antibody production. We have pathologic data looking at meninges and brain tissues from patients with multiple sclerosis. And we have interventional data from drug studies such as rituximab to kind of prove the point that B cells are incredibly important in the pathogenesis of this disease. But what are they doing? So let's shift gears a little bit from multiple sclerosis and the pathology behind it to B cell biology. So B cells uh, undergo both T cell dependent and independent activation. So there is a way to turn on a B cell without needing an autoreactive T cell. And ultimately, with the appropriate antigen present, you're going to get antibody production. That's the ultimate purpose of B cells as far as we know. They do function as antigen presenting cells to T cells, but really the effector portion of B cells is to produce antibodies. And how does a, a, a human being with only 30,000 genes create an antibody repertoire that needs to cover billions of potential antigens? The way it does that is through a series of biologic events with both germline and somatic hypermutation. So we have a germline genome for the B cell antibody chains, but they undergo rearrangement, the so-called VDJ rearrangement. And this creates a certain amount of diversity. And if you do the combinatorial math with the number of V genes, D genes, and J genes, we have, you can get a certain number of antibodies. But that is far than enough uh, for us to be able to attack all the different pathogens and antigens that may come into our lives. Hence, 
within each of these families, and we're going to talk about the variable region, you're, you have areas that can mutate, and within them you have both height and within the variable regions, both heavy and light change, light chains that can recombine to give you more diversity. So there are a lot of ways that B cells create the diversity to recognize different antigens. So what happens uh, relative to the genetics and the ultimate effector functions of the B cells? So you have a mature B cell with antibody expressed on its surface that binds an antigen. And it may bind the antigen more or less loosely than, than one of its uh, uh, sister B cells. Based on the affinity of the antigen for the antibody, you get what's called affinity maturation and clonal expansion. There is a selection for B cells that have tighter binding to antigen. And this selection occurs based on mutations that occur within the variable regions of the B cells. So as with each successive B cells, you get a little mutation and it binds a little tighter, it may be selected more or less. And ultimately, you form two populations of cells. A memory B cell, which can uh, reactivate in the future, act as antigen presentation, and secrete cytokines to augment inflammation and attract T cells to the point of inflammation. Or you create plasma cells, or plasmablasts, which are basically major antibody producers. And as you track in oligoclonal bands, what we think you're seeing are the specific clonal antibodies. But what you're missing is what's happening behind it, and that is the B cell selection over time. So the affinity and avidity are really driven in the variable regions. And as seen here of an antibody, you have a heavy chain and a light chain, uh, the variable heavy chain and the variable light chain. And it's this variable heavy chain that drives that binding. So if you take detailed sequencing from memory B cells, you basically have the instruction manual for the antibody it produces. So uh, there are a variety of ways to um, characterize the immune response of B cells. What we have done historically is just take the antibodies and see what antigen they bind to. These are laborious, dirty, uh, sometimes hard to reproduce experiments because in different conditions, antibodies may bind in different ways. But in theory, each clonal, and in practice and in reality, each clonal B cell is responsible for one of those antibodies. So if you take the genetic code of that B cell, you have basically isolated, at the genetic level, a single antibody. And you can start to separate out the biology instead of taking pools of antibody that may have wildly different characteristics of binding and ultimately wildly different uh, biologies. So the hypothesis that was generated by Nancy Munson here at UT Southwestern was that just uh, as an antigen-driven disease can have a serostatus, do you or don't you have antibodies associated with it, an antigen-driven disease, such as multiple sclerosis, should have a unique B-cell genome associated with it. So instead of measuring the antibody as the immune response, you can measure the B-cell genome in a much more precise way, in a much more granular fashion, in order to document what the biology is and track the disease over time. So indeed, that's what uh, Nancy started working on years ago here at UT. And what she found was a unique mutational signature in B cells derived from spinal fluid of multiple sclerosis patients. So she found, uh, as shown graphically here, compared to healthy donors, that certain codons within the variable regions of, uh, of the antibodies uh, of the B cell antibody production genome had more mutations than, than, than what we saw in healthy donors. So in healthy donors, there's a spread of mutations. You're, you're acting against a variety of different antigens. You're, you're on the prowl. But as you get the B cells involved in multiple sclerosis, they hone in on, on certain codons to mutate. And what she developed was a scoring system. So spinal fluid was obtained from multiple sclerosis, multiple sclerosis patients via, via lumbar puncture. And we do this all the time clinically. It's the test we do for oligoclonal bands. A cell pellet was isolated. So you take out all the cells from that fluid. And then you use flow cytometry to separate out the B cells. And what Nancy did in her lab was separate out the B cells into single cells in a 96 well plate. Then you go in at the single cell level, isolate the DNA, and then do sequencing. And you can look at the variable regions of the heavy chains and compare them to databases and control sequences and see if there are mutations in a certain pattern. And what Nancy saw with this single cell PCR uh, Sanger sequencing method was shown here. Among patients with multiple sclerosis, or even patients with those clinically isolated syndromes, those first events, there was a higher mutational rate in certain codons, 
compared to other neurologic diseases or healthy controls. So indeed, MS patients seem to accumulate abnormalities within certain parts of the genome in a way different than other patients. When we looked at patients who had uh, confirmed multiple sclerosis, their score, and there's a mathematical algorithm you can use to create this score, counting up those mutations, uh, seemed comparable to individuals who had just a single event, meaning this biology can be quantified early in the course of the disease. One concern was, would patients have to have multiple events and accumulate these B cells over time in order to see that they were mutating in a given uh, fashion? But indeed, patients, even at their first event of multiple sclerosis, had scores that were in line with what we saw of full-blown MS. This seems to be an early, prevalent change within the B cell biology of multiple sclerosis patients. So when we go back to Nancy's original data, which looked at CSF-derived B cells, single-cell PCRs, one of the questions that comes up is, is this score being driven by mutations, or is it being driven just by a certain prevalence of genes? Meaning, if patients have rearranged uh, to have certain heavy chains in their uh, uh, B cell repertoire, are we really just counting those codons and not necessarily the mutations? So she underwent a series of experiments uh, to look at this question. And indeed, there is overrepresentation of certain codons within the um, uh, scoring system uh, of this uh, antibody gene signature score. And when you take these codons out, it changes the score in a significant way. So. Uh, the 431, 439, and 459 codons seem to be uh, driving the AGS score that we see in patients. And if this was the case, uh, it may or may not have as much biologic uh, um, importance, and it may not be the mutations, it may just be the codon frequency. But when they looked at the representation of these codons in MS and, and the control populations, the other patients, we found that those codons were expressed basically equally. So indeed, the AGS score is not being driven by merely the expression of these codons in the rearrangements, but by the hypermutations that are occurring within these codons. So it seems to be that uh, what Nancy's lab has seen is a true biologic signature and not just a mathematical anomaly based on codon representation. So if you look at the, the so-called antibody gene signature score by Sanger sequencing, you see that there's a pattern of somatic hypermutation that seemed to be both sensitive and specific for a marker of multiple sclerosis, even early in the course of the disease. But to be honest, doing single cell PCRs is not a very clinically viable thing that I could do uh, in a, my MS practice. It's a huge uh, endeavor in terms of the labor uh, that's involved and is not very uh, uh, easy to access uh, from, bed, from bedside to bench. And so in order to make this discovery a more clinically meaningful test, you'd have to develop a new method for identifying sequence patterns from whole cell collections, not single cells. So now you have to be able to take the whole batch, sequence everything at once, but then sort out whether or not that mutational frequency is there. And indeed, in, in partnerships um, uh, with uh, Nancy collaborators and, and uh, team at Diagenics, uh, the move went to next generation sequencing. So it, what's shown here is taking the samples again that were looked at in terms of single cell PCRs, but now taking whole cell groups using next generation sequencing off that whole population and showing that you can tease out the same antibody gene signature score. So it is possible in a much more robust fashion and a platform that's easier to transport uh, out of the bench and closer to the bedside a way to fish out these sequences. And so technologically this is important and is actually the basis of an ongoing clinical trial. So the large scale clinical trial is a multi-center trial, it's nationwide recruiting over 250 patients to do next generation sequencing and determine on a large scale, can this signature be recreated? So seeing a signature, uh, seeing that hypermutation pattern is great. It is, will be one of the first advances uh, in understanding the biology of MS in a long time that's clinically useful, possibly from a testing point of view. But really from the scientific point of view, the next question is what's the functional impact? What are these sequences producing? What are the antibodies doing from these hypermutated B cells that seem to be unique to multiple sclerosis patients? So what Nancy's lab did was, since we had the DNA from single cells, you can generate recombinant antibodies, pure recombinant antibodies, 
uh, produced based on the genetic code. When we've taken antibodies from the CSF of multiple sclerosis patients, it's a dirty group of antibodies that, re that can stay in all sorts of things, and you never know the relative prevalence of one antibody versus another. But by taking uh, antibodies recombinantly designed at a single cellular level, you can start to understand the pathogenesis of the disease in a very different way. So in a first set of experiments, uh, what uh, the Munson lab did was look at mouse brain tissue uh, using no antibody, a negative control, and a positive control uh, that was uh, generously provided by uh, Betty Diamond's lab to Nancy Munson. Uh, in the top of the screen, and then a series of single recombinant antibodies in the bottom of the screen showing that indeed these antibodies weren't just an epiphenomenon floating around, these B cells weren't an epiphenomenon, they were producing antibodies that bind to tissue. This was the first pass looking at it. When a deeper dive was taken looking again at mouse brain, uh, what they found was there were antibodies that would bind to both the cortex and the white matter. Now remember, back in the 1860s, even Jean-Martin Charcot indicated that this is not just a white matter disease. This is a gray matter disease. And yet we've had a very difficult time understanding the immunologic pathogenesis of something that is supposed to have myelin as the antigenic target, all of a sudden having all this gray matter disease. And here we're finding from actual MS patients that they have B cells producing antibodies that uniquely stain cortical structures. So uh, using uh, uh, immunohistochemistry, the antibodies uh, found, at least in this one patient, seemed to bind to neurons. These weren't binding to myelin or oligodendrocytes. These were actually binding to neuronal cell bodies, not necessarily what's expected in multiple sclerosis. So these were the early um, uh, stabs at looking at uh, the recombinant antibodies. From there, uh, Dr. Munson's lab has gone further to look at the transition from mouse to human brain and to expand the number of recombinant antibodies that are being screened in this fashion. And basically what you can see in each of these panels with controls being across the top of both the mouse and the human brain uh, and the research antibodies being below, that there are unique staining patterns uh, from patients who present with a variety of different demyelinating conditions who go on to have multiple sclerosis. So they may bind uh, in some patterns with one patient and in different patterns with another. So they seem to be unique to the patient from which they come. If we do, uh, again, immunohistochemistry, we can see that there are patterns of staining where you are predominantly neuronal and staining where it is astrocytic. And I, I want to dive deeper into this with the next slide. So over these couple slides, you're going to see uh, immunohistochemistry looking at uh, different cell populations within the brain. Noted here first is stains with a neuronal marker, which you see, which is the red dye, and then the recombinant antibodies from five distinct patients uh, labeled with a green fluorescent protein, and then the overlay. And what you'll see in the top panel is there seems to be a very clear overlay between the uh, recombinant antibody and the neuronal stain suggesting that this patient's antibody was an antineuronal antibody of some kind. But as you move lower, there is a lack of overlap. If you look at AJL01, which is just a code for uh, the patient from which uh, the um, antibody came from uh, to keep it all blinded, this patient doesn't see, this antibody doesn't seem to bind to neurons at all. But if you switch the stain, and this is true both for mouse and human, and the reproducibility for mouse to human has been quite good. If you switch to an astrocytic marker, in this case GFAP, that first patient that had the binding that co-associated with NUN, the pattern doesn't overlap. But when you move down to AJL01 and some of the others, indeed there is an overlap. Just some patients, or at least some recombinant antibodies from patients, have a strong uh, binding profile for astrocytic markers, and other patients have antibodies, or I should say other antibodies from different patients, have strong antineuronal binding properties. This disease, multiple sclerosis, was a white matter demyelinating disease described 150 years ago. Over the last 40 years, we thought of it as an autoimmune reaction against myelin. And here we are with the Munson lab at Southwestern identifying recombinant antibodies from a selected group of B cells, an overrepresented population of B cells within these multiple sclerosis patients that is uniquely staining non myelin antigens and may be very important for the pathogenesis of the disease beyond the relapsing stages that we so commonly see in the clinic.
fascinating was the staining of certain antibodies to cells that express nestin. And this was shown both with uh, immunohistochemistry as well as um, looking at uh, flow cytometry data. And these uh, neuronal progenitor cells, which are nestin positive, were bound by certain recombinant antibodies from uh, patients. Thus, it may not even just be the mature cells that are affected uh, by antineuronal antibodies or antiastrocytic antibodies, but this disease may have an autoimmune profile that affects progenitor cells even early in the course of the disease, which may make a difference for people's repair mechanisms and recovery mechanisms, if not the progressive stage of this disease. It's an intriguing finding uh, that has not been previously described. So the antibody staining patterns uh, fall into different categories, and I've only shown you a few of them here uh, as the work continues to go on. But the recombinant antibodies which are generated from B-cell clones, identified exclusively in MS patients, have binding patterns to a variety of cells in both mouse and human tissues. There have been over 30 clones that have been created, and the staining patterns are being analyzed and correlated with clinical data. Remember that list of symptoms at the beginning of the talk relative to multiple sclerosis, fatigue, pain, cognition, depression, a variety of vague cerebral network uh, symptoms, not the weakness from hitting a motor track. One of the things we're doing is sorting out, well, these different staining patterns, the staining of neurons versus astrocytes, et cetera, explain okay. some of the different uh, symptoms so, uh, um, uh, that we have. And so uh, it is important for us to continue uh, looking at the clinical correlations uh, with this group. So in conclusion, uh, basically these B cells from patients with multiple sclerosis have a unique signature um, relative to their somatic uh, hypermutation pattern within the VH4 region. The areas of hypermutation uh, can be used to distinguish multiple sclerosis uh, from patients without uh, multiple sclerosis. And even in early patients, the so-called clinically isolated syndrome patients, we uh, see this pattern. And finally, when we look at the antibodies that are produced uh, from these patients, it makes a difference uh, in terms of our thinking of the pathogenesis. They have a very unique binding pattern, and that binding pattern may have clinical implications. So the future directions where we plan to go with this is that there, we're going to better define uh, the regions with hypermutation. We're going to look at the, clinically, uh, the clinical value of this as a diagnostic test, and that's the ongoing clinical trial. Can we have a better way to differentiate multiple sclerosis from not based on these patterns of hypermutation? And we're going to look at the antigenic targets of these antibodies. This work has been a collaborative work amongst a number of people represented here in multiple different university labs and, and uh, associations. The Munson Lab, which has led the team, uh, Nancy Munson and her group. Uh, we have an active repository staff and clinical enterprise here at UT Southwestern, a bioinformatics core. And then there have been collaborations at different universities identified here, of which a lot of this work uh, could not be done. We do always thank the patients who've consented to take part in research. None of this could happen without them. And the funding that went into this uh, was both at the NIH level, the National Multiple Sclerosis Society level, and Diagenics, uh, which has funded some of the work within the Munson lab. So with that in mind, uh, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Um, as you know, within the question and answer portion on, on the web, you can type in the questions and, and we'll take them. Uh, I'll deal with the first ones that have come up. So the first question I'm being asked is, how effective is the role of neuropsychological rehabilitation in MS considering its progressive nature of deterioration? And this gets to the issue of cognitive decline in MS. One of the biggest issues that got ignored for 50 years in MS was the impact it has on cognition. And indeed, if you look at easily half or two-thirds of our patients uh, with multiple sclerosis, they have some pattern of cognitive dysfunction. We have just started to look at the role of cognitive rehabilitation. Can we train people to have better cognition? And indeed you can. There's very limited data on the longevity of the effect within multiple sclerosis. So we, we don't know if you get a benefit from neuropsychological rehabilitation, will it be a sustained benefit? And so uh, it's, a, it's a good question. I'm, I'm not sure we know the answer yet, but it's still something we routinely recommend if patients do have cognitive dysfunction. The next question I'm uh, being asked is, do we see any interaction between T and B cells in your model? So uh, we know that 
B cells act as antigen presenter cells to T cells, and that T cells can drive B cell responses and B cell repertoires through cytokine production and activation with transition of B cells from mature B cells into plasma blaster memory cells. We have not taken the clonal populations of B cells as of yet from these patients uh, in this set of experiments to look at T cell interactions. We know they exist, they exist in, and that's been shown in multiple sclerosis before. We don't know if the cells that have unique uh, hypermutation patterns have a differential response to T cells. Um, we wouldn't necessarily expect them to, uh, but it's an area of study uh, that is worthy of being looked at. So uh, there's a, a comment uh, indicating, uh, or a question I should say, asking, why haven't we matured a whole lot more past Charcot's definition of MS decades ago, and I'd say over a century ago. So Jean-Martin Charcot described multiple sclerosis in 1868, and we're still describing it in a similar fashion in 2014. In some respects, that's a little scary. But it's actually work like what Nancy's done and others that I think are going to finally start to dissect this out. And it, it actually summarizes the problem. We lump a lot of people with a certain phenotype whether it's a clinical phenotype, an MRI phenotype, or a pathologic phenotype, into one diagnosis. They're not one diagnosis. There are different biologies at play, but we've never had a sensitive measure to get at the underlying biology. What looking at the antibody profiles, uh, the antibody gene signature profiles does, is gives us a much cleaner way of separating out the immune system molecularly to try and decide what's happening within our patients. And so I think this, combined with other research, may hopefully get us a little further away from the way Charcot described things and uh, hopefully in a better place for our patients. So the next question is, in relation to the role of B cells in the immunopathology of MS, if B cell activation in the form of oligoclonal band production is the most uh, is the most consistent immunologic finding in patients with MS, what predicts markers of B cell activation within the CSF of patients with MS? So we don't know what predicts B cell activation within CSF of MS patients. We just know that they are there, they're there early, and they seem to be a driver of the disease. And so presumably it's whatever they're relating to antigenically which drives their reaction. Since uh, 1942, the question goes on, when these oligoclonal bands were first described by Kabat, which is correct, by knowing that B cells have paradoxical roles in autoimmunity, exerting both pathogenic and protective effects, what have been the achievements of scientists like you, like me, like Dr. Munson, in the targeting of different antigens? So uh, the author here brings up a uh, excellent point that not all antibodies are bad antibodies. Uh, there are some B cell responses which are helpful and protective in autoimmunity, and indeed we have not uh, sorted that out within this, this cohort. There is ample evidence, though, to say, at least for relapse remitting disease and to some degree for progressive disease, that these B cells play a pathogenic role. If you go back to the evidence of correlation of follicles with pressure, of the usefulness of depleting B cells at suppressing relapses, it seems as though the B cells are more harmful than helpful, although I'm sure that's not globally true for all the B cells there. Sorting out in an antigenic fashion what the antibodies are doing is critically important, and we're working on that as we speak. And um, we have questions about partnerships and collaborations. We do. We're always looking for collaborations um, relative to uh, this work. And uh, by all means, we encourage you to reach out to us. We work with a w wide variety of groups, as you can see from the slides here. There's a question on the role of microglial cells in MS progression. So uh, great question. Uh, remember, I made mention of the notion on that busy slide with different parts of the immune system in the brain to adaptive and innate immunity. Um, and within adaptive immunity, the, the T and B cells, obviously there has been a whole host of work. But the innate immune system uh, within multiple sclerosis is something that has not gotten the level of attention that it deserves. And this includes both the periphery at the dendritic cell level, where we know that there are changes in function uh, relative to dendritic cells of multiple sclerosis patients, and the um, innate immune system of the brain, the microglia, or the so-called macrophages of the brain. We know that there is some evidence of exaggerated microglial activation in multiple sclerosis, and this may correlate with progressive disease. 
There are new uh, imaging studies, PET-based imaging studies, uh, as well as basic biology studies that look at the role of microglia in MS. And indeed, I think you're going to see an evolving story on microglial activation and multiple sclerosis that may have new therapeutic targets. Now, the interplay between the innate and the adaptive immune system is also an area of significant uh, interest because they talk to each other. The, uh, the innate immune system and microglia can activate uh, B cells within the adaptive immune system and vice versa. So there's a question about alternative medicines and beneficial effects for treating multiple sclerosis. This is a completely underserved um, area within MS. We know that there are a variety of ways patients can manage their symptoms as well as their disease. Uh, the alternative medicine, quote unquote, the non-FDA approved, I should say, or holistic approach to treating MS that's gotten the most uh, uh, supportive evidence for it is the data uh, regarding vitamin D. There is data to say that if you're vitamin D deficient, you have a dramatically increased risk of developing multiple sclerosis, and individuals who are vitamin D deficient and have MS probably have uh, more relapses and a more progressive course. When supplemented, uh, there is some data to suggest that vitamin D supplementation and driving a person's vitamin D level to higher uh, rates in the blood, so not the dose you take, but how much do we actually get into your body, can drive down attack rates in multiple sclerosis. Presumably, this is occurring because of effects on the immune system, although that has not been conclusively proven. We know that B cells respond to uh, vitamin D levels in a variety of different ways. And when it comes to holistic or alternative medicine, this is the one that probably has the most um, uh, uh, data supporting its use. The next question is, what is the most effective treatment considering B cell as the main player, based on my view? So the most effective treatment of multiple sclerosis, uh, I don't think we know the answer to that in um, head-to-head -head trial data. So, so we, we have not taken all the FDA-approved or even uh, non-approved drugs and put them into a head-to-head -head comparative effectiveness trial. It's not been done. Um, the drugs that seem to, from their independent trial data, have the most potent impact on the disease. Uh, from the FDA-approved drugs, uh, natalizumab uh, uh, probably has uh, the best data, fingolimod, uh, and uh, dimethyl fumarate have extremely good data. And it's worth noting, all of these drugs have impacts on B cell function or migration. In terms of trials that may not have led to FDA approval um, uh, or been submitted for FDA approval, for example, rituximab has not been submitted for FDA approval uh, uh, or review, uh, it was pretty profound effects on the disease. And so I think there's ample evidence to say that drugs that have some uh, impact on B cell biology um, makes a big difference in terms of the disease. So there's a great question here on uh, how do we know that this B cell response is not driven by the T cell activity? And uh, you're, you're right. Uh, we cannot prove the chicken and egg uh, issue between which comes first, an autoreactive T cell or an autoreactive B cell. Really what we can do is do subtraction studies and say, well, what if we take the B cell component out? What happens to the disease or the T cell component out? And as we just discussed with the, the last question, uh, B-cell uh, targeted therapies make a huge difference. Now, the next logical question is, well, are we just impacting their antigen presenting cell um, uh, functions? And we don't know the answer to that, but um, it, it is a critical player in the disease pathogenesis. It would be nice to know which came first, T-cell or B-cell. I'm not sure we're going to be able to answer that at least anytime soon. So there's a question here on whether or not we used any antibodies specific to mutant proteins, and are we able to see differences in expression between normal and mutant protein expression using immunohistochemistry? The answer is no, we haven't looked at, at specific mutant proteins. We've done this from the antibody side, not the antigen side. So we're not screening for the antibodies, which has been the classical approach to B cell studies and multiple sclerosis uh, for the last 30 years. You take the antibodies, put them on a dish, and see what, what antigens get stained, and you have an array of antigens. What Nancy's lab, uh, Dr. Munson's lab has done is gone the other way, which is let's make the antibodies in a clonal uh, manner, make a pure batch of the antibody, and start hunting for what antigen they bind to in their native state. And that's the work that's going on now. As you saw, we have a variety um, of different uh, cellular targets uh, but we're starting to work on what are the uh, underlying antigens within the cellular targets, and that work is early going. Um, one of the um, 
parts of that work is to also sort out within patients and between patients, are there different patterns of staining? So it would be interesting to know that if some patients are more neuronal, or some patients are more uh, astrocytic, or some are oligodendrocyte or myelins, and do those have clinical correlations? And as we sort out uh, those different areas, drilling down the specific antigens obviously will be incredibly important. So I think this will be our last question. Uh, I mentioned that most MS patients test positive for Epstein-Barr. Are there other diseases where the majority of patients test positive for a particular virus? And is there an ongoing effort to investigate if a causal, causal relationship exists? Um, so uh, a variety of chronic conditions and autoimmune diseases have been looking for associated viruses for a year. The data for Epstein-Barr and multiple sclerosis is probably the strongest out of any of the autoimmune diseases in a virus. This one probably has the, the strongest association. And so it's something that receives a lot of attention. So I appreciate everybody's attention and hope you have a great rest of the conference.